Hey listeners, if you like this podcast, check out our other shows, The Study Table and Training Table. Listen to archived content and in-depth interviews with insiders working with student athletes. It's on our website, www.fredopi.com. Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how to provide more information about Dr. Alvina Fulton. I had an opportunity to listen to her give a lecture back in the late 1980s at Howard University. And at that time, changed my diet for the purpose of increasing my my athletic performance. Uh, at the time, I was still playing a competitive sport. I had graduated from Syracuse University with a physical education degree, and because of that degree, was very interested in sports and nutrition. I was getting ready to try out for the U.S. national team. So all these things were happening when I came upon the work of Dr. Alvinia Fulton. She self-published all of her books. She was an herbalist. You could only get her products at her store. I thought about writing an autobiography about her, thought about doing a fiction book, using her as a template for the character. But ultimately, I settled on the number of interviews that I have collected over the years about her and her life, put that all together into the segment you're about to hear on Dr. Fulton. I hope you'll enjoy it. And for those who hear this, knew Dr. Fulton, worked with Dr. Fulton, have some of her recordings, have some of her books, made recordings of her radio show, please write to me at fredopi at f-d-o-p-i-e at gmail.com. That's f-d-o-p-i-e at gmail.com. I would love to put together more shows about Dr. Fulton, but I can only do what I have in terms of sources. So I hope this inspires uh, people who knew her, knew of her, and have all kinds of memorabilia about her. Enjoy Dr. Fulton and everything I know about her. The movement, of which we know now, which has exploded to a multi-trillion dollar movement, she was at the forefront of that. There came a time in her life that she had a $3,000 a day. That was a bad day for her. And you know, most of our getting sick today is what we eat and what we drink. And that is what causes so much breakdown of the body. And that's why we have kidney problems. And you get on a dialysis, you know, you'll come off a of dialysis, you dial. There's no way to come off unless that body is cleansed right. You uh, did not come here to live this little short life full of aches and pain. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And you can have b- abundant life putting anything in this body. Shaking hands with her was like putting your hand in a vice grip. So you knew, and I'm talking about in her 80s, she was a strong-willed and strong woman to go along with. The queen of nutrition and dietitian to the stars. Alvina Moody Fulton is not well known as a pioneer in the holistic health movement. To uncover her story, I made use of a blend of newspapers, magazines, autobiographies, and some ethnography, including her own writings. Employing the methods of social history and cultural anthropology, I also conducted interviews with people who knew her. These are oral histories of people talking about her work, people such as activist Dick Gregory, who learned most of his holistic health expertise from Fulton starting back in the 1960s. Gregory's and others I interviewed frequented Fulton's health food store, restaurant, and herbal pharmacy on Chicago's South Side, as well as heard her deliver lectures. I collected their history to learn more about Fulton and her contributions to the early years of the health fitness movement. Many details about her life we still do not know. Fulton migrated to Chicago from Pulaski, Tennessee. Her parents were farmers and devoted Christians. She grew up on a soul food diet and by her own accounts, my greatest problems concerning food in my particular case was that I more than often overate which resulted in constant reoccurring colds, sore throats, and increasing health problems and an operation. After she migrated to Chicago, serious health problems continued to plague her. In 1954, she was rushed to a hospital in Chicago with a bleeding ulcer. Some weeks after, 
she learned about a Stanford University physician named Garnett Cheney, who developed a natural cure for stomach ulcers, which included the consumption of raw cabbage juice. After 13 days of the treatment, she was cured of the stomach ulcers, and more importantly, she was introduced to the natural living movement. Fulton would go on to say, It came, and then as a matter of course, that I became a health food, health store devotee and enthusiast. I had to curb my zeal and desire to influence and convert others, for each must develop his own desire to investigate the news, wrote Fulton in her 1980 book, Radiant Health Through Nutrition. Perhaps the greatest change in her eating habits came after attending a lecture given by Dr. M. O. Garten. Garten argued that therapeutic fasting could eliminate all kinds of sicknesses, diseases, and abnormalities in the body. Under Garten's supervision, Fulton went on to a 13-day fast. When it was all over, she noticed the elimination of long-term problems in her body, such as arthritis, upper respiratory congestion, and swelling in her ankles. The fast also reduced the size of a tumor in her body. Fulton said, the tumor was smaller. When I consulted Dr. Garten, he suggested that I eat raw foods from six to nine months and start another fast. This is how I learned about raw food and became a vegetarian. It all sounded strange and impossible at first, but the transformation was truly amazing and revolutionary. As Fulton's commitment to natural living increased, she invested in a juicer, blender, and stainless steel cookware subscriptions to health magazines and books written by leading experts on food reform. Fulton would go on to earn a degree from an unknown seminary and a doctorate of naturopathic medicine from Lincoln College of Naturopathy in Indianapolis, Indiana. But the years she earned the degrees are unknown. Most likely she received a doctor of holistic medicine, but I could not find documentation on her academic training. In addition to her formal training, she would go to Asia and Africa to learn additional information. Uh, you know, I'm a preacher, and I have to say this. I'm a preacher, I have to say this body don't belong to you, it belongs to God. Jesus died for it, to heal it, to save it, and to keep you well in it. And if you listen to him, you will keep a strong, healthy, well body. Fulton saw her work as a calling from God to serve the people in the impoverished south side of Chicago and beyond. She spent her entire professional career working on the south side of Chicago in a low-income neighborhood where the criminals protected and looked out for her. Her grandson, Robert Gray, said she never suffered from burnout because she had a burning passion to help people and God had a hold on her life. Comedian and activist Dick Gregory. She was... Uh one of the fine mind and spiritual. She was a minister, nice, kind, was one of the, the beautiful forces on this planet. Fulton offered an alternative diet and improved people's health and energy levels. They in turn told others. Her expertise in products worked so well that they attracted all kinds of customers. Dick Gregory. She was a master herbalist. She knew what combinations to put together. When you go by and see her and your blood pressure go down, you tell your mother, your father, sisters and brothers, and that's what, that's what her was based That's what her stuff was based on. But she was always there, and the respect she got from that white health movement was just, just unreal. Dr. Eileen Silver is a doctor of naturopathy. She met Dr. Fulton at a conference and spent time in her store. She describes herself as a student of Fulton's expertise of the importance of the colon and maintaining one's health. She honestly was a pioneer. If you look back on the naturopathy movement, you know, a hundred and something years ago when the naturopathy doctors were the major influence of, of affecting health, at that time what happened is you would go to a retreat place of some sort and you would maybe run naked through the sun. <laughs> You'd eat some vegetables, you'd drink water, and lay around and rest and everything. I mean, they had this, this whole, pr everybody got treated the same. Well, I'd say she ramped that up a notch. She treated everybody the same, too, but it was a detoxing approach. That was really not in vogue when she was doing it. She is one of the premier pioneers of the whole concept that life and death begin in the colon, and that toxicity in the body can tremendously interfere with assimilation absorption. You didn't have to even really look at what the disease was. If you treat it with 
some of those really great life principles of resting the digestive tract, which consumes a vast majority of our energy, and getting that sunlight and getting more rest and getting that water to bathe the cells and detoxify those cells and everything, no matter what's wrong with you, it's going to be better, you know. And so from the same standpoint, she ramped it up a notch from that in realizing that sometimes when the body has long-standing toxicity, particularly now, because 100 years ago, people weren't eating all this fast food and all this artificial food and stuff that we are now, and they weren't breathing so many fumes and chemicals, and they weren't living in a closed house with formaldehyde in the carpet and all those different things that we're exposed to now. What she did is kind of what naturopathists did for health 100 years ago. She did back in, in the 60s and, and, the, and 70s and into the 80s and 90s, really. But she was one of those old individuals not running a popularity contest who was willing to step out and stand up for what she believed in and say things that weren't fashionable. She knew about parasites and all those things and talked about those things back when no one else liked the subject. George O'Hare served as a publicist for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jesse Jackson, and Dick Gregory. Gregory introduced her to Fulton, O'Hare would go on to become her publicist and one of her clients. She knew something that a lot of people don't appreciate. There's people that will go to doctors, regular medical doctors, and pay way over what they pay because they know they're going to get something good. See, in other words, you, people will pay for what, what they, they get what they pay for. They knew she had success story. People would say, I used to, I took that, I, I'm all right now. People would say, what's her name again? What's her name again? You think she was a real savvy business-wise? Hey, she knew what she knew. She knew she, her, her advice was worth something. So therefore, she, she knew how to merchandise. But I tell you what, her books were the ones that went. went. And, and she did self-publish just about everything in her book. Yes, she did, yeah. But I want to talk to you about the books that you could get. First of all, I have a fasting prema. I've been teaching fasting since 1955. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Dick Gregory's fasting. Well, I taught him that. And uh, the system of fasting I have, I don't think anybody else has it. I haven't heard of anybody having it yet. Uh, and then uh, another little book that I have is Ten most commonly asked questions about fasting. Uh, people do ask questions. They want to know if they're going to get hungry, if they're going to get hungry, or if they live through it, or if they get sick, or what will happen. And then another one, Radiant Health Through Nutrition. This is almost a textbook. Radiant Health Through Nutrition. We have that book back at the, at the booth. And then, uh, I'm not saying that you or everybody else should be it, but I've been a vegetarian uh, since 1955. Uh, when I finished school at uh, Lincoln College of Naturopathy in Indianapolis, Indiana, I became a vegetarian before, and I mean complete vegetarian. And I can give you a diet if you have to, if you come to me and, have, and need a diet, I can give you a diet that will include some animal products if you want them or think you need them, but I would always say, don't fry them, don't fill them full of grease, bake them or boil them naturally. And so this book, Vegetarianism, Facts or Myth, is one of the books that I, I wrote many years ago, and then this one here, Kitchen Bible, uh, this book, uh, the booklet was written in 19, uh, you'll see it if you get a copy, it's written uh, December the 11th, 1964, uh, and it tells you about, about cooking. Uh, we overcook our food, and one of the reasons we need enzymes and need to go on a fast is we cook our food to death, and it has no life in it. Uh, uh, timetable for how to cook your food. Uh, some of us don't know how long to cook what food. We just cook it and overcook it. Anything cooked, no matter what it is, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit will have no life in it. It's the same, you can take a peas or beans and uh, a corn and plant them. If you don't cook them, they will grow. But if you cook them, there's no life in them and they won't grow. So it will do something to the life in your body. That will I, I'd like to explain to you about cooked food. So 
this is a little booklet that you need to know about how to cook and prepare your food. And the reason we need fasting so much is because we have overcooked our food and starved our body of its enzymes, its vitamins and minerals, and that's why we need to cook our foods. And Pyramids of Power will, uh, is another book that you can get back at, the, uh, at our booth. Uh, but you see, the time is so short. When you've been doing something for 50 years almost, it's difficult to put it in 30 minutes. And so that was short. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. If you're enjoying this show, check out the episode entitled Women in the Culinary World, which includes Fred's appearance on the Chef's Table podcast. It's available on the Dinner Table show page. Even if you go back to the antebellum period, it's the women who are cooking the special meals on those days when enslaved people have a day off and they're able to visit one another. It's the mothers and the grandmothers are doing those things. And even after emancipation, it's women who are always at the forefront. They're preparing the meals, they're allowing those meals to be taught to the younger generation, both male and female, and continue the food ways really through their own experiences and what they learn from their mothers and grandmothers. So I just see women is very much involved in soul food, and I try to make sure I, I give homage to those women throughout the years and throughout the centuries. Now back to the show. Fulton traveled extensively throughout the United States lecturing on university and college campuses. I attended one of her lectures at Howard University around 1989. For those in holistic health and natural living, she had been a household name since the late 1960s. George O'Hare. People would come to her lectures, then they'd want her back again, and they'd bring her back. She would fly out to New York, fly to Los Angeles, fly overseas, and fly right back. She, she would just go to see that person. They paid. Her work attracted professional athletes, celebrity artists, and actors. O'Hare remembers regularly picking up NBA Hall of Famer Bill Walton early in his career from the airport and dropping him to Fulton's store on the south side of Chicago. They gave her the correct title. She was the dietician to the star. Because one day I got a phone call from Dick Gregory saying, there's a white guy that's going to be a great basketball player. And uh, Bill Walton, pick him up at the airport and take him out to Dr. Fulton. And every, at least twice a week, he'd fly in just to get in my car, go out there, get the big bag of stuff, and get back in the car and go back in the airplane and go play. And Dick Gregory and Dr. Fulton gave him such, such help that he won the MVP and he told uh, Dick Gregory that he would not accept the award unless he came up on the stage with him. That is what I saw happen to a, a star, as you might say. And you Stevie Wonder, you name the stars, they all, uh, Ozzie Davis and, and uh, Ruby D and uh, other basketball players. It, it was just phenomenal. Dick Gregory. He had a lot of black celebrities, Ozzie Davis, Ruby D. Different folks would fly in to, to see her because they knew about her. In addition to giving lectures, Fulton leveraged radio stations in different markets across the country to market her expertise, products, and books. I had three radio shows going on at the same time in Chicago, WYCA and WBEE and WVON. I had those shows going on, three of them in the same week all the time. Quite often, I'm on radio, even here in Los Angeles, and I have been for many years because I have been coming here for, uh, since 1972. That's how long I've been coming here to the conventions and all. George O'Hare. WVON had a following because she did the, the, the station has a, I'll call it a religious following, not religion as we know it, but I mean religiously that people they listen to it and, and learn and then go out. She, she would go to WVON radio, a black owned, black run station probably one of the two in the country, and she, by the time, on a Saturday morning, 
one hour at a time. She'd go in there with nothing but herself and talk on the microphone. And every time the people would call in and say, I've got arthritis, I have a problem with my foot, I have gout, I have my, my headaches, my migraines, she would tell her on the radio what the body's going through. And you got to watch out what you eat. Are you, do you have a lot of do you eat sugar? What kind of sugar do you eat? And she'd diagnose on the telephone, but never give a prescription on the phone. She would say, come into my store, and the place would go crazy. The problem was people would take off right in the middle of the store, and she's, when she leaves, leaves the station, everybody's out. People drive up the state. She's got another hour out, out the, in the uh, vestibule out there talking to people. Okay. And now the people come in the store and they say, where's she at? They come to the store. <laughs> in 1958, Fulton became the founder and director of the Fultina Health and Fasting Institute and eventually Fultinia's, a combination health food store, restaurant, and herbal pharmacy at 65th and Ebhart on Chicago's south side. She later relocated to a brownstone on 53rd Street in which she lived upstairs and set up her business downstairs on the street level part of the brownstone. Despite growing her business in a rough part of the city, it became well known for the sale of herb and vitamin pills and the potions and solutions that she mixed. Her grandson, Robert Gray, who lived and worked with her for many years, says that Fulton created a cure for HIV, which attracted a lot of clients seeking relief. It has to be raw and natural. And that's what we need, raw, natural foods. We need them raw as possible. Now, you can cook them, but don't overcook them. Stir fry them or steam them and don't cook them to death. Or even better yet, if you eat a raw salad, a raw, you can even, even eat a raw soup. If you grind up the vegetables or the fruit. And you can even have a raw soup. Dick Gregory. Now, let me tell you how I met her. Uh, I was running for mayor of Chicago in 1967. And I come back into my office, and the woman said, oh, the black lady, really nice, brought all these salads by here for you. I had been a vegetarian. And uh, so I said, well, you know, running against my daily, you can't eat nothing somebody bring you. But anybody bring anything by, write their name down, and eventually I'll go by and thank them. So I went by one day to thank her. And uh, we sit and we talked. See, all these pimps, hustlers. And I said, wait a minute, I know these cats ain't into no good eating. And I know they would come in, sit down at the counter. She'd mix them with salad. And she would, and I didn't pay too much attention, but then she would put the salad dressing there. And I noticed they would get up and leave, and the salad would still be there. This happened over and over. So I said, wait a minute, what is this? And she said, well, I have herbs and stuff in my salad dressing that they claim, you know, makes them potent. And they was coming in, and she, now she didn't sell it like that. She said, well, they come in all the salad so they could drink the dressing and leave it. Registered pharmacist Taylor Hagen met Dr. Fulton at a conference and spent time in her store. It was a hodgepodge of uh, health foods in her store, uh, health products, uh, alternative health products, potions and solutions that she mixed, and nobody else but her uh, could ever get away with doing what she was able to do. But she was pioneer in her uh, uh, health endeavors. She wasn't afraid of the FDA. She wasn't afraid of the AMA. Dr. Eileen Silva. Her shop was really kind of unique in that everything in her whole facility, she had a lot of different products, and she worked with different health products that I recommended and worked with over the years as well. But she also created some of her own things, and she had her own belief system and everything that she carried kind of fit within her belief system. Well, she didn't just carry things she could make money on. She honestly stood very firm, I believe, to her principles and her values. If the medication is for a heart condition, uh, whatever condition it might be, diabetes, hypoglycemia, uh, whatever condition it is, because there are herbs that will fit anything that, you, that the drugstore can make. The herbs will take care of all of that. And I happen to know what herbs they are. 
So whatever that herb is that you need to take care of the condition that you're taking something from the drugstore for. Now, I know they've been fighting, and they've been fighting us a long time, and I've been fighting back every day. You know, I've never been challenged. I've never been arrested. I've never been uh, condemned for nothing I'm saying or doing because they know as well as I know that I'm telling the truth. That if we eat the way God and nature intended us to eat, we will stay healthy and live longer. A 1999 obituary published in the Chicago Tribune described Dr. Alvinia Moody Fulton as a woman who could soothe the ills of her neighbors and friends in the poor South Side Chicago neighborhood with a cleansing mix of herbs and natural ingredients. It went on to say that Fulton touted the healing powers of raw foods, juices, and fasting as the path to healthier living. So what can best be described as a long-term impact of Fulton, this not well-known pioneer in the holistic health movement? We return to some of the voices we've heard in this program. George O'Hare. Dr. Fulton was really popular, I, I think she, she was made popular because she was the one that stood by Dick Wrigley during his Vietnam War. And once that got out, then, then she got people from all over the country, all over the world, that she's doing what she's doing. Dick Gregory. That I don't know anybody other than Elijah Muhammad that had the ear of African American, like she did. He had it on a national level. She had it beginning in Chicago, and then it started reaching out more to white folk when she would go to the conferences. The movement, of which we know now, which has exploded to a multi-trillion dollar movement, she was at the forefront of that. She was very well respected because they knew about her fasting knowledge. Dr. Eileen Silva. She had her followers. She did. She was like the guru. She was like the shaman. I I have always given her credit and will till the day I die of being a major um, shaper of some of my my basic philosophy about the importance of cleansing. I think she focused tremendously on the colon. You know, there's no question that I got my conviction of the importance of that whole concept from her. And I believe she was a very influential person. This excerpt of Dr. Albina Fulton speaking about fasting is her at her best. It's an example of her expertise par excellence. It's an excerpt of a longer lecture that she gave at a unknown location. It gives you an example to see this, how passionate she was about this. There was a time in which I listened to her regularly and fasted once a week and felt incredibly good because of it. I've gotten away from that and created this segment of Dr. Fulton as a way of reminding myself of the importance of fasting. Listen to it, learn from it, and apply it wisely. I consider uh, two phases of fasting. The, to, to get a good scientific cleansing, healing, body correcting fast, you have to give a cleansing for at least five days with herbs. And I don't let anybody go on a fast under my supervision if they're hungry. The hunger must leave. And if you get the right herbs and fruit, the hunger will leave within three to five days. Then if you have no hunger, you can go on a fast. But don't fast hungry, because if you do, you will eat. And if you want to eat, you should eat. But I have started people fasting like I did Big Gregory. That's why he learned it from me. And... uh, I told him to go on a fast for 21 days. 21 days is over, he wanted to go 30 days. And I let him go the 30 days and supervised him through that. The next day he wanted to go 40 days. And he went 40 days. And uh, then he came to me and he said he wanted to go on a fast for the Vietnam War. And uh, because I told him that anything you want or need, Here's where the will of God comes in. 
If you talk to God about it and ask his aid and assistance in fasting, you will get what you want as long as you're not infringing on the rights of someone else. I said, I don't think you're infringing on the rights of anyone when you go on a fast for the Vietnam War because you're doing this for peace. You want to know what you can do to correct your body of aches and pains, of aging, fasting will make you younger, keep you younger, longer. You see, I've been doing it uh, over 40 years, and people sometimes ask me how old I am. Well, I tell the woman, tell age, tell anything. So I don't tell them, I say, stick around. And then and, and, and when they read the dictionary, you get it then. I go with a method of cleansing the body so there's no hunger. And when there's no hunger, you can fast as long as you want to. Fast until the appetite comes back, because it will leave with the preparation I give you. Fast until the appetite comes back, uh, and the tongue will get all white and coated. Fast until the tongue gets red and clear again. And fast until your breath and your body become sweet, and it will do that. And if you fast, you will keep your body youthful, flexible, full of energy, and spark and vitality, and that's what we all want. And nothing will do that like cleansing and preparation for fasting and fasting. I don't care what the drugs you take, uh, what else you take, nothing can heal and build and re relieve your body of the waste and toxins like fasting. Water fasting is better because water fasting will cleanse the body of the toxic waste, uh, uh, heal the body of the old dead cells that are there that's been there a long time. And the best way to do that is to give the body a cleansing and then fast. And when you fast, you will find your skin becoming resident and youthful and beautiful. Your hair, your eyes, your body, Every glad in your body responds to fasting. And that's what we all need, the, the cleansing of water fasting. Now, you don't have to, if, if your family and your friends around you tell you you're going to kill yourself, you don't have to listen to that, you don't have to believe that. But just remember that in the Bible days, they fasted 30, 21, 30, and 40 days, and nobody died from fasting. The prophets, Jesus, and the women of the Bible fasted, and nobody got sick or died from that. Queen Esther fasted and saved the uh, children of Israel from extinction by fasting. Fasting is the way of life in here. <laughs> and yes, the, the fast should not have just went on water or juice by itself. Neither, never go on water or juice by itself. Take some herbs and give the body a cleansing first. Move some of the toxic waste out of the body. Whenever you see a big waistline, uh, uh, there's some waste inside there that's been there for many years. Uh, most of us ever since we got potty trained, we've been carrying waste in our bodies. And if you get a nice small waistline, uh, then you can fast with every water, as long as you want and you'll be healthy from it. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Dr. Fulton was talking about that you have to prepare for a fast, and when I prepare for the fast, based on what she told me, is that I used a colon cleanse that, uh, for about five days. Yes. And that colon cleanse helps to clean the body, and, and, and hers has a red clover in it, and it's really important that when you're cleansing, you also cleanse the blood, and red clover is a blood cleanser. And uh, as I went through it, the thing that amazed me, I was never able before to stay on a diet. I mean, I couldn't stay on anything. On, on, a, plan, on a, a fast more than a day, if I did it a day, it's an accomplishment. But after doing that and doing the cleansing for about five days, I was able, I expect in my, my goal was to fast until I was ready to come off the fast. I gave myself permission 
to say it on if I want, but I could always come off. And it's really important how you come off. And I went 21 days. And on the 20th day of that fast, I was still having bowel movement. And that's really important for people to understand how much weight is in the body. Uh, that, you know, you can stay on it and adjust your uh, liquid and still have bowel movement. That's correct. The first time I went on a long fast, on the 25th day, I couldn't get out of bed fast enough to get to the bathroom because I had not, God knows I hadn't eaten a bite of anything. And here this waste was coming out and I had to rush to get to the bathroom and I actually saw it getting on the way to the bathroom. Say, um, if you have an impact colon, you know, not just uh, fecal matter, but you know, these sides that are impacted with Yes, it will help get it out, but then you follow up after the long fast, and you, you follow up with changing the way you eat, even changing the way you think, and I mean what you think about food, your, 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 your emotions, your thoughts, and your whole body will change when you change and realize that food is not the thing that keeps you alive, but the thing that keeps you alive is the cleansing of the body and getting the toxic waste out of the body. How long do you have to fast to cleanse out the side of the wall of the cold? Uh, I would say 21 to 30 days. And then after that, break that fast and do it again until you no longer get a coated tongue until you no longer feel hungry, you no longer feel tired, weak, and nervous, and you have energy. And when that youthful glow comes to your body, there's your family and your friends around you will ask you, what are you doing? You're looking younger. You break a fast like you begin it. You break a fast by going on uh, fruit juice, but you don't have it fresh and raw, you sort of heat that to break the enzyme action of it. You take that fruit and take it five days. And when you take that fruit five days and break it the fast, you will have energy that you will know what to do with, and you will understand why you're not hungry, neither will anyone else. You, you will not have hunger when the fast is prepared right, when it's broken right. Now, stop the drinking that stuff that you're drinking and eating the thing you're eating and keep the body healthy. You uh, did not come here to live this little short life full of aches and pains. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And you can't have abundant life putting anything in this body. Uh, you know, I'm a preacher and I have to say this. I'm a preacher, I have to say this body don't belong to you, it belongs to God. Jesus died for it to heal it, to save it, and to keep you well in it. And if you listen to him, you will keep a strong, healthy, well body. To check out our podcast archives, suggest show topics, and advertise on the show, and to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good.